everyone. Uh, I'm Scott Pantel, CEO of Life Science Intelligence, and I'm here today with Paul LaViolette. Paul has been in MedTech for over 35 years. I had the honor of hearing him uh, do a presentation about 15 years ago, maybe more than that, when he was with Boston Scientific, but he's got a, a long and successful career with big strategics, sits on the board of many startups, uh, joined SB Health Investors in 2009, where he's currently managing partner and COO, and they have just launched a MedTech Convergence Fund. Paul, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure, Scott. Good to see you. It's great to see you. So we have the summit coming up in May where you've been gracious enough to join us to do a fireside chat. You and I have talked offline about what a fireside chat exactly is, and maybe we can have some fun with that later. But I'd love to just get current with you. Can you tell us what you're up to these days, what's going on with the MedTech Convergence Fund and just generally what you see in, in the market? We are up to normalcy, I would say. And I, I feel uh, unusual depicting it that way. But listen, we're deploying capital. The healthcare system is up and running. It has its pressure points, but uh, the role of innovation is, is unchanged. Uh, there are lots of weak spots in, in healthcare delivery that need to be improved upon. And, and the march of technology is undaunted. And so we're active, we're deploying capital, we're constantly looking at new companies. We're doing everything in our power to adjust, if you will, to the current norm. I don't know uh, when there will be a new normal. We're certainly not in one today, but we're, we're working hard and we're trying to find good investments, and those investments are going to be predicated upon delivering clinical and economic benefit to the healthcare system and hopefully helping patients. That's great. And I know one of the things that's unique about your fund is that it is focused on early stage, something that isn't uh, necessarily the norm. So I believe you guys are looking at Series A, even some seed stuff. Um, is that true and why? Well, it is true. Uh, why? Uh, a simple answer for why is that it's it's obviously a uh, it's an open space, uh, but then there's a reason why it's open, uh, which is that a lot of folks have run away from early stage. So if you if you deconstruct the problem, medtech investing has had a mixed track record, and the mixed track record is associated primarily with long hold times. Right? You associate. Uh, all venture investing with risk and you will have failures. The problem has been in the past that we've had successes, but even though successes have taken on average too long, uh, obviously the more capital that gets poured in, the longer you hold it, the weaker the IRR. And when you have a few successes in a fund and too many failures, the fund will not you know, be sustained. So uh, importantly, with the MedTech Convergence Fund, we, we have said we're, we will do early stage, but not conventional early stage. Uh, we, we will not do an early stage cardiovascular implant, as an example, that has to go through three years of preclinical, a year and a half of pilot studies, then a pivotal trial, then a, then a PMA approval with a panel. And, and you can't stack up that critical timeline and get to less than eight years there are a lot of ways to fail along the way. And so eight years plus risk of failure, even to the even at the very end, there's a risk of failure. That's just too daunting for early stage. So that's why there's a paucity of capital available there. And we're not investing in those sorts of things either. We're trying to invest in technologies that can dislocate care to lower cost settings closer to the home that can take advantage of the convergence of new technologies, sensor technologies, batteries, obviously everything associated with telecommunications, everything associated with, with, in, with information processing, and um, do that in a way that um, uh, has a shorter uh, time to market, uh, lower clinical and regulatory risk, and therefore lower overall investment risk. Uh, if you can package that into a shorter hold time, lower likelihood of failure, then you can afford to go early and have uh, a hold time that is not nine years, but is four. And if you can do that, uh, taking advantage of the technologies that are available today that are being packed into these innovative technologies, then you can have investments that are reasonable hold times that still have disruptive potential for markets and therefore uh, good exit values, but 
lower capital demand along the way. And that's our formula. That's outstanding. And, and how has, uh, has the COVID era accelerated what you guys were all, has it changed your investment strategy? Has it accelerated what you're doing? Uh, has there, what's the impact been? It, it has. Um, in some ways, it's a catalyst. And I would say that in the sense that we're, we're not standing up telemedicine companies per se, uh, but there is a, an element of our value proposition with the fund and the, and the companies we're investing in that, that will benefit from a patient provider, uh, maybe company triangle uh, that allows for therapy to delivered to be delivered uh, remotely from the hospital, maybe at the home setting, uh, to connect the physician to the patient, uh, to upload data so the company can aggregate information about its therapeutic value, and all of that is enhanced by a physician who is comfortable seeing the patient remotely by a patient that now has encountered telemedicine experiences for the first time, COVID related and has found that they're uh, extraordinarily convenient, that they can access their physician quickly, that they enjoy the interaction and the uh, kind of the uninterrupted time online with that doctor. Um, and everybody realizes now that they can do that. They can pull that off in a way that they'd never experienced, frankly, in 2018 or 2019 or much of 2020. And so that is a catalyst for this kind of business model for medical therapy delivery at the home that is something our fund is taking advantage of. So in that regard, COVID is a catalyst for those types of investments. Okay, that's, that's uh, good timing. It's always, it's always good to have good timing and take advantage of situations that aren't necessarily ideal. Um, and that's what we do. Uh, that's what we do. Tell us about some of your current investments uh, that you may be particularly excited about. I know EBT Medical is a company that you guys are invested in. They're one of the companies that are presenting at our summit in May. Uh, so tell us a little bit, maybe get current with EBT and any other areas or companies that you're uh, especially excited about. Right. So we've made four investments in the new fund. EBT Medical was, uh, was the first or second. It was close to being tied. Uh, Keith Carlton's done a fantastic job there. Overactive bladder, a very large market. As you know, uh, sacral nerve stimulation is on label and approved and has created a, a real obvious neuromodulation opportunity for, for uh, overactive bladder and, and pelvic floor disorders. Uh, but the overall penetration rate in that market today is extremely low. And we believe there's something, uh, there's something in that message given the unmet clinical need. Uh, EBT Medical has a very novel uh, way of uh, treating uh, pelvic floor disorders and, and overactive bladder, uh, importantly through uh, the saphenous nerve, which is a nerve that is I would say untapped uh, today in any of these uh, therapies. So focus on a novel nerve, therefore tapping into a novel mechanism uh, and uh, through a very uh, uh, either non-invasive or minimally invasive energy uh, delivery source. We think that is going to be a very appealing value proposition for patients that are currently suffering uh, from urgency that uh, have decided that it's not quite, uh, that they're not quite ready for uh, a battery driven uh, neuromodulation implant. And um, it's just an example of the kind of movement where we can take uh, a, a significant implant, move it to continuously less and less invasive, and then ultimately maybe non-invasive therapies and make uh, therapeutic alternatives available to a wider range of patients that today are, are going uh, uh, without, without treatment. Terrific. So, um, will we see more investments out of the fund this year? Is there going to be a second fund too early to ask that question? Tell us a little bit about the trajectory of the fund and where you see things headed. Well, we're in, we're, we're just about to start full year two of the investment cycle. So too early to talk about, uh, follow on funds. I I'd say we're ecstatic, however, about both the, the nature of the fund, its investment targets, uh, the uh, target richness, if you will, of the areas that we're looking at, uh, EBT Medical being a good example, Zorigo uh, being a great example, Zorigo was our second investment, uh, taking again advantage of connected health 
uh, dermatology, uh, skin conditions like psoriasis and vitiligo. Between those two patient groups alone, over 10 million uh, patients. Runaway expense today with uh, specialty pharma and biologics. Phototherapy is defined clearly by the American Academy of Dermatology as working, but it's extremely unwieldy to deliver, requires a, a long series of, of uh, repeat uh, office visits to get phototherapy in a dermatology suite. That can be put into a connected device, phototherapy delivered at home, monitoring the uh, therapeutic uh, regimen, compliance, and benefit directly connecting the patient to the dermatologist, um, unlocking uh, a therapeutic known, right, which is Neroban ultraviolet uh, B light delivered. We know it works, but it has been underutilized because of logistics and lack of connectivity. So that's a great example. Uh, we think that unlocks great value for patients. We think it unlocks great value for payers who are really struggling with uh, biologics expenses. And that's an example of uh, the kind of thing that we're looking at. And frankly, we're seeing deal flow like that routinely. So we've done four deals in the fund. Uh, we are, we're, we're certainly expecting to do a couple of deals this year. Um, and if you track that out uh, over the next couple of years, we'll, we'll fill up the fund, but it'll, it'll be uh, certainly uh, two to three more years at a minimum. Okay, that's great. So, and thank you for that update. Um, shifting gears a little bit, and I know that you sit on the board of many companies. Let's talk about Trans and Terex. Uh, you guys recently closed a financing. Um, we've got a really unique uh, market. We've got Medtronic and J&J &J that don't necessarily have a, a platform that's projected to get through FDA in the next few years. So update us on Trans and Terex. What do they mean potentially for the market? And uh, what can you share with us uh, from this company? Well, Transenteryx, if you really step back and say, uh, how large is, this, is the robotic uh, surgical uh, or digitally enhanced surgical opportunity? It's massive. Intuitive Surgical has done a spectacular job of creating value there. Uh, most of Intuitive Surgical's uh, opportunities have been the conversion of open surgeries to robotic assisted. Uh, if you think about transenterics and the Senhan system, it really is focused on a different set of surgical uh, targets, which are laparoscopic uh, procedures requiring a different setup, different vectors. Transenterics is the only other robot approved in the United States with uh, on-label uh, uh, capability, uh, commercial access uh, for general surgery, robotic surgery, um, not meaning uh, for soft tissue. So non-orthopedic, non-spine, it's really only intuitive and transenterics that, that go after that space. And transenterics is positioned separate from intuitive because it's really lined up for laparoscopic procedure conversion. So I think the, the potential there is, is uh, spectacular. Company's been public for a few years, very early stage, difficult to be public in early stage, had valuation uh, pressure for a while, has shown dramatic inflection in valuation over the last uh, couple of months. I think uh, overcoming the, the financing question mark has been, uh, has been uh, uplifting uh, for the company, uh, doing very well now. Uh, we'll have great news flow really uh, a fantastic platform. The fact that Medtronic and J&J &J have struggled, I think just simply shows how difficult it is to get a technology of this magnitude to the market and approved. Uh, don't really know what their revised uh, timelines are for US availability, uh, and I'm not sure they do either. So uh, those are challenging uh, programs. Look at the value that was invested in Verb, which has now been uh, subsumed into J&J &J as, as one of the programs they're trying to manage. Very difficult thing to do, and I think it shows how uh, capable and um, impressive uh, the work uh, that's been done by Transenterics really is. Well, congratulations to you guys, and definitely an exciting space. We'll be watching carefully, see how this plays out, and um, very exciting times for, uh, for that space. So, as you're aware, Paul, we've got 120 plus CEOs of venture funded startups that are out raising capital. They'll be with us in May. So if I were the CEO of a series A, series B company today, um, any advice or any watch outs or any things that, that 
that you guys are looking at when, you, when you're looking at metrics for new investments? Any advice for a CEO of a Series A, Series B startup today in today's market? Well, my advice is uh, come in with a great story, but be able to back it up. Um, we've all seen, uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen a, an, an investment uh, pitch that, that didn't call out a billion dollar opportunity. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I've launched a lot of products and had uh, a lot of commercial successes and not many billion dollar successes. So let's, I, I really like a team that is extraordinarily competent. I like a team that owns uh, and fully embraces and lives in its market opportunity and knows everything about it. Listen, companies will always have a lot of things that have to be developed, a lot of, a lot of um, achievements, a lot of execution to overcome. We know that. Uh, that's what we're looking to put money behind. Um, what we don't want uh, are companies that uh, bring in promises about big opportunities, but can't really answer uh, challenging questions about those opportunities. So uh, there's plenty of risk to be piled onto a company just based on execution uh, in the future. Let's not add risk by not really knowing everything we're supposed to know about our opportunity. Um, so that aligning your competency, your personal skill, your deep knowledge of the space uh, with your request for capital, I think is job number one. And uh, I'm going to presume that everybody knows much more about their space than I do. Uh, if you can't answer my off the cuff questions, then that's, that's a problem. Uh, and and uh, most investors have seen a lot of uh, pitches. They don't need to be wowed with upside. I think that they want to be wowed with realism. Got it. Okay. That's great advice. So you and I had a conversation a couple months ago, uh, kind of a fun conversation. I think we were, we were debating or trying to figure out how we, how we came up with this idea of a fireside chat. And some of, some of your uh, Japanese colleagues had asked you, I think it's kind of a fun story. So what is a fireside chat, Paul? It's a comforting mechanism in, in the end. Okay. Uh, and we have, uh, I believe, FDR to blame for this uh, in the depression when uh, when, of course, we didn't have 24-7 uh, news uh, media and people really wanted to hear what was going on and they wanted to have some connectivity to leadership, but also some feeling uh, that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, that was a dark time. Uh, we're probably in a dark time now. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the current administration is, is thinking about rejuvenating uh, fireside chats and has actually used that phrase. Um, and so I listen, there's an informality associated with those chats. It's, it's an effort to connect one-on-one, -on -one, right, with the speaker and the listener. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a communication tool that can be used effectively. Uh, and I, I think it's, um, it's, it's wonderful to see in conferences now that that, that turn of phrase. Uh, but it's always about, listen, let's, let's uh, if, if this were music, it would be unplugged, right? Let's be unplugged. Let's be connected. Uh, let's share thoughts uh, and let's relate. I think there's a relatability goal with a fireside chat that that doesn't come with with a scripted pitch. That's great, and I I look forward to having that chat with you uh, in May. I think the weather will be slightly warmer than what you're experiencing today. Sub 20 degrees, I think, is what you had said. We're about 65 or so out here in sunny Southern California, but. Uh, it really is an honor to have this conversation with you today. We're looking forward to that fireside chat where we can just talk about our industry, talk about solutions, and be in a room filled with investors and innovators and strategics that are looking to solve problems for patients. So um, is there anything that you'd like our viewers to know, anything you'd like to add before I let you get back to your busy day? Uh, be safe is the message. We are a year into this uh, daunting time there is light at the end of the tunnel. Don't let up. That's great. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, it's been a privilege to speak with you. Looking thank forward you, to Scott. seeing you in a couple months and thank you so much for your time. Have no, it's my day. pleasure. All right, Paul, thank you.